Yeah, absolutely. I'll kick it off. I feel okay. like just quickly looking through all the names, I'm having a conversation with uh, friends. So appreciate uh, seeing everybody and uh, a lot of my friends from Alberta, but outside of Alberta too. So it's very cool um, to see you. I feel like this is the only way we can connect to these days is on the screen. So uh, really grateful for you guys all being here and uh, hopefully I can, you know, share something. And uh, so uh, Reagan and Mark, thanks um, for asking me to be here. Thanks to the Federation for putting this on for the outreach for all the coaches and um, asked me to talk a little bit about path, my pathway, but then I wanted to throw in a couple lessons in hindsight that I think I've learned around the way. So um, just put some pictures to put, a, put it alongside of uh, the conversation, but um, there is a chat feature. If you have any questions at any time, um, you know, just put them into the chat feature. I can see it pop up and I can help address them. There's like a raise a hand feature as well. Uh, that we can use. So I can see both of those. So if anyone's got any questions or comments or um, if you want me to dive into something that maybe I brushed over, feel free to, to do any of that. So um, just also want to acknowledge all of you for being here. I know everyone's like on the screen all the time. Um, so I know that you, in order to be here, you have to be um, getting back on the screen again. And you're also giving something up to be here. So, you know, whether it's time with your family or, or yourself or it's work or um, you know, any sort of hobbies, I know you gave that up to be here in this conversation. So probably shows, you know, the type of people that we have here, but also just want to acknowledge you for, for giving that up and allowing, allowing me a space to share on, on some of this. So I think the first thing um, that, you know, is probably my number one lesson is uh, to search and find uncomfortable situations. And I, I think Mike McKay's on here, and he's probably one of my biggest you know, pushers of getting me into uncomfortable situations. But, um, you know, this is where in hindsight, I look back and really realize uh, how much I learn in these situations. So I uh, just want to say thanks to all of you for putting me uh, in the situation to talk about myself, because it's one of my most uncomfortable situations, uh, is uh, actually just talking about my thoughts and me as a person. So um, you know, I really feel that if I'm not uncomfortable, you know, once a month, or if it's been a little while since I felt uncomfortable, then I know I'm not pushing myself. I know that uh, I'm getting too comfortable and I'm not really fulfilling what's possible. Uh, so I think that's like what my number one lesson. And I, I just realized how much that helps me. Um, in this current job, you know, for example, I'll show up in Mumbai and, you know, I'm doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing and what I prepared for, but then someone will say, oh, can you run this practice in this rural community on a dirt uh, court this afternoon? And, and um, you know, then 40 people show up to watch. And, you know, all of a sudden you're in this really uncomfortable situation, the balls don't really bounce, and um, no one really knows how to play basketball, and you're supposed to be come in and run this, like, elevated practice. Uh, and so, you know, I just realized that by keeping myself in this uncomfortable, when I, when I get into those situations, it's so much easier to navigate. So um, I'll talk about some of the uncomfortable situations uh, throughout you know, this kind of pathway, but um, thank you for, for providing me the one for the month. So I'm good till next month now. So thanks. Um, so just, I'm going to touch on this light, but I was, I was born in Ottawa. So I grew up in Ontario, love sports, any kind of sports. This is like our high school team. So we look like really gearing there, but, um, you know, love to play basketball was one of the sports, but also love diving, softball, um, honestly, anything where I could move, play soccer, track. Um, and, you know, I, I ended up uh, tearing my ACL, which I'm sure much, a bunch of people either know people who have or have themselves. Uh, and I actually decided, so I did that in diving and actually decided to, um, you know, play things on solid ground. And so, you know, stayed on solid ground. And that's where I actually leaned into basketball, ironically, uh, now knowing how much ACL tears happen within basketball itself. And so uh, I was always playing club and, and school basketball prior to that, but really started to play uh, more basketball. Uh, and then also went to um, high school for performing arts. So I actually went there for dance, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and so dance ballet and, and modern for four years while I was there while playing basketball. Uh, dance teachers hated the fact I was playing basketball, but uh, again, for me, it was just more activity uh, and I really enjoyed uh, some of the performing sports, so like dance. 
Um, with that, I ended up uh, getting surgery on my knee and one of my coaches uh, had me come to club practice early and start working with, um, you know, the younger team that was there. And I loved it, like just loved coaching. I loved working with the, with the kids and uh, started to, to get into that. And then um, after that surgery, I ended up buckling the knee a little bit again. And I was able to run in straight lines, but I couldn't pivot. And so I couldn't play. Um, but my coach, again, kind of pushed me into officiating. And I talk about these two things because they're actually, uh, and this next one, the, the Carleton University and scorekeeping, they're like very pivotal pieces of, um, you know, how things come back later and you have no idea at the time. Um, but the officiating, so I started officiating and uh, in my mind, I just thought, you know, if I can't play, I'll learn about the game in every other way. So I'll coach, I'll officiate, I'll score keep and learn everything else about basketball if I can't, um, you know, play play with my team. And so I uh, ended up taking up officiating and, and officiated um, like boys and girls and college and um, so forth in Ottawa. And, um, you know, Carlton was close. So I was still in high school. And so, you know, I just went and score kept some of the games and I don't know, they maybe paid me like a couple bucks. And, uh, you know, it was another opportunity for me to see university basketball. Um, you know, I would, that was the place to go for runs at Carlton. So in the summer, that's where you would go for a run, but um, got to see the team sort of play throughout the year. And uh, so, yeah, I remember score keeping um, there. And I actually remember um, Georgia, who was the head coach of uh, the University of Windsor at the time. And I, I remember this distinctly. She came up and shook the hands of everyone at the score table's desk um, and introduced herself. And it was the only coach that had ever done that in the all of uh, the University League. And uh, I actually remembered that. And it's funny because when I ended up at Canada Basketball, she ended up being one of our uh, learning facilitators. Um, and I remember going back and telling her, like, I, I can remember being 17 and you doing that and thought, you know, when I coach, I want to do exactly that. And so I always, when, when I was coaching at Red Deer College, I would always go up and shake the hands of the scorekeepers prior to the game. So I always thought that was so cool. So I think as coaches, um, you just have to remember how much of an impact you have, not just with your players, but everyone else around you. And I think, um, you know, I was impacted uh, by her and so many others as well. But that scorekeeping is another one I'll circle back to um, in a little bit. And then I went to uh, University of Ottawa, uh, did undergrad in kinesiology, really wanted to stay home so I could um, continue coaching. And so just got, you know, a bit lucky with some uh, really good um, zone teams, essentially. Um, they were like MVP and BDP teams. And so ended up uh, winning a couple of provincial championships that way uh, with some really talented kids and started a house league and um, continued officiating. So, you know, really got a good base in Ottawa. And then, you know, someone told me, oh, I think I do have some photos um, oh, I for, almost forgot about that. Yeah. And then coached at Ottawa U. Um, was an assistant coach at Ottawa U. Um, I taught uh, high school, actually, uh, at uh, just in Quebec, uh, just on the other side of the border. And um, taught high school for a year and realized that like, I don't want to do that. Um, and so really had to figure out what's my next move. And so we had a, a great run at Ottawa U that year. We ended up uh, fifth in the country, I think. Um, but, you know, a bunch of really great women on that team who I'm still in contact with and good friends with. So uh, it was a really good introduction and experience. And I learned that anyone who was really coaching had gone to the NCI. Uh, and so that that's kind of leads to number two, the volunteering of the house leagues. And um, often when I was officiating, I would like stay and score, keep the next game. So I just wanted to like watch the game and uh, see what's going on and, you know, volunteering scorekeeping and sometimes getting paid for it um, and really being open to those new experiences and, and trying to, you know, say yes to what that might be, even though, um, you know, not sure if I'm totally prepped for it, whether it was like teaching at the time um, or, you know, coaching on some of these teams or moving across the country to go to the NCI. Uh, and the position that they offered was actually, um, it was uh, with Ken Shields being my mentor. And if anyone, I'm sure if you've met Ken, he's like probably the toughest uh, teacher you could ever have. So it took me like six months for him to like really have a conversation with me um, other, other than grilling me. And so, uh, and then it was with the men's college team. So I think it was maybe 24 um, as an assistant coach with um, Kamosan College. And so again, we just had another really great season, great guys, ended up going to nationals, um, 
we have a medal there. And, you know, ironically, I can't even remember what we placed, but um, we, we did well uh, and the guys were great. Uh, and then ended up uh, with Ken is where oh, I went to the National Coaching Institute. So that was a really big uh, piece is the NCCP. And so my dad was actually a lacrosse coach, a hockey coach, and is taking his NCCP and, you know, uh, said, why don't you take it? Like you're starting to get into coaching. And so I actually took it in high school, um, took my level one, you know, the theory and, and technical, which they had at that time. And so um, by the time I, I was done my undergrad, I had my NCCP level three, which opened up this opportunity to the National Coaching Institute, um, which is essentially level four, level five. Uh, depends if Ken's if Ken's um, your mentor coach, then uh, you know you get a really great experience. You might not get your level four, but it's part of um, the growth there. And so um, the NCCP really allowed me um, to open up these sort of opportunities. And so while being there. Uh, Ken had a contract with the prevent, uh, pro team in Japan, and so that's our team up in the top right. So I went as like the bag carrier, like anything he wanted, um, I showed up. And so uh, we worked with the pro team, and Laura Lynn Murdoch's there, who's the athletic director now at U UBC, no, UNBC. Um, so she came with us. She was in my NCI class. Uh, and it's pretty interesting, like how many coaches across Canada either had been through the NCI. I think, Mike, you'd done it. I mean... Uh, McKay, Mike had, uh, Mike McKay had done it. Like there's so many coaches that you, as you communicate and talk with, how many people have really been through that pathway. Um, and so it was a really big pivotal moment for me. So worked with the men's, got introduced to international, really fell in love um, with international basketball. Like the fact that, um, you know, even some of the conversations uh, in Japan, you know, it was really interesting. I remember sitting down. Um, so this was actually the head coach of this team was the first ever women's pro um, coach in all of Japan. So there'd never been a head coach that was a female. And I remember sitting with her assistant coaches and, and them telling me that they were, um, it's really great that Kibi wanted to do this, uh, but, you know, she'll never be able to find a husband in this role. And so, you know, really seeing how basketball and roles and, and so, much, so forth play out uh, around the world. Um, we also went to a high school game and you kind of walk in. Um, I'd walked in, we walked in and um, everyone, all the girls had their head shaved. And um, you can see the women on this team, their hair is just starting to grow out because they had a female coach and it was very um, normal if you were out of defensive position for a coach to grab you by your ponytail or by your hair to pull you back into position. And so the women to counter that would, would shave their heads. And so you can see now they're not with one of the male coaches. And so these women was the only pro team in this league that actually had longer hair um, because they were with a, with a different coach. So it was just so fascinating to start learning about all these sort of um, different nuances to basketball around the world. Uh, so again, continuing to look for opportunities and, and continuing to learn and develop. And I think that's something I've stayed committed to um, throughout. And so um, with that, um, by chance, the women's position actually opened up the head coach position. So ended up um, moving to the women's position. And again, we just had a really great season. So um, I think on average, when I took the team there, on average losing by 43 points a game. Uh, and so I uh, had to do a complete rebuild and uh, pull together of this team. And we did, and we ended up finishing third in the province. And so I uh, went on this crazy after Christmas run uh, and uh, it just really worked out. And so had a really great time. We went ski kayak or um, uh, sea kayaking, uh, went on a, a bit of a bonding trip and uh, it was a really great uh, first, you know, post-secondary team that I got to work with. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, that one wasn't full-time uh, and Red Deer College uh, opened up. So I see Mandy here uh, with, uh, with the Queens, but, uh, you know, Red Deer opened up and it was a great opportunity for a full-time position. Uh, and so ended up moving to Alberta and, uh, you know, teaching kinesiology and, and working with the team. And that was a, a really unique um position with Red Deer College is the ability to be able to be in a professor's contract where essentially the athletic department buys you out of part of the professor's contract. And so there's not very many of those at the time. It was like U of T, I think Coach K had it at St. FX. Like there were very few contracts like that across the country. And so um, it was a really great opportunity. It was another rebuild situation. 
Um, the team had been losing for a while, so it was a, a big project, definitely cut out, but ended up um, having like an amazing group of athletes. We ended up going to Cuba uh, a few times for training camps over Christmas and um, just had some really great athletes around the program, in the program. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're in the mix, I would say, uh, for a little while. We didn't get as good as I wanted it to be. I don't know if we ever really get there unless you're like, you know, winning over and over again. But, uh, you know, had some really great experiences. And, and I really turned um, to that program into sort of a two-year opportunity. Like, come in for two years. If you weren't ready for university, where could you go? And we ended up with eight athletes that ended up moving on to post-secondary um, experiences. So really worked at it that way. And what was unbelievably cool about Red Deer College is um, the professional development access that you had, too. And so um, that allowed me to work with the provincial team in the summer. Um, and so ended up uh, getting some great coaching staff, some great players. I know some of you are on this call as well, which is so um, amazing to see you and your parents um, here and had some really wonderful summers with uh, great groups of athletes that clearly um, still stay in communication and have you know grown into the game and out of the game um, and have been around. So we had some great summers. Uh, did well again, so that was really exciting. Uh, and great coaching staff, so, like you know, Doug Leon was there, Veronica was there, uh, Joe Embelson came through um, one year, and so had some really great teams and uh, went on some U.S. tours and got into some of the Nike tournaments because again we got some some nice talent out there. So had some great summers there, and then um, the other PD opportunities again, and this goes back to sort of what was it my number three like develop and learn. And I really stayed committed to that. So I uh, went and worked with the Bermudian national team, uh, went and followed um, a German pro team um, for a little while, uh, went to uh, Latvia to sit and watch some practices with their Olympic team as they were heading off to the Olympics. Uh, tried as much as possible to get into Canada basketball. I remember um, Coach Stapleton was coaching at the time and, and was able to come in as an observer to a lot of those practices, which is open to people now. I know in Edmonton, you guys really benefit to the women's team being there. But, um, you know, those were huge learning opportunities for me to see, you know, what's going on around the world, but also what was going on across the country. Um, got a chance to coach with Ontario basketball and we won um, a national championship at provincials. And I know a lot of you have been provincial team coaches and, you know, I've really felt how rewarding that experience is as well. And then I ended up doing um, a second master's. So the first master's I did was at the University of Victoria with the NCCP. And that, so that was a master's of education with a concentration in coaching studies. And this one, um, and to be honest, as I, I really reflect, as I was going through, I ended up getting my tenure by the time, I think I was 28 uh, at Red Deer College and almost didn't know what I was supposed to do next and was really trying to explore what that looked like. And um, and so I decided two things. One, um, I really had to market the program, especially there was like, what, 14 other schools in Alberta, uh, colleges. There were 14 other colleges. And then there was other universities. And, you know, I really realized I had like an 18-line an budget or 18-tabbed budget out. I realized that I really had to market the program and I was never taught how. And so, um, you know, I saw that as a gap and I decided to learn and develop there. So ended up doing a master's of sports marketing and communication um, in Italy. And that was with, in conjunction with the EuroLeague. So that was um, a two-year program. And ironically, their school year was opposite ours. So I could go um, and do that between May and August. Then there was like a couple Christmases that I had to run over um, and do like a thesis presentation or something like that. So, um, and what's really neat about this group is I actually see a lot of these people in a, and when I went to Canada basketball. So one ended up at the Federation in Bulgaria, um, another one's at the Greek Federation, another one works for EuroLeague, so I often we'll see them there. So, um, you know, not only did the, the people that I ended up graduating with, like Laura Lynn and, and a couple of their coaches, do we end up seeing each other across our country, um, then I ended up starting to see a bunch of my colleagues around. Um, and so that's where, uh, after that, the opportunity with Canada basketball opened up and it, it was in coaching education. Um, and I think uh, for me, for one, I wanted to try out the masters and just see how that worked. And so again, being really lucky with Red Deer College, I could take a sabbatical, uh, take a one-year contract with Canada basketball and dive into that blend between, you know, the, the marketing and communication and education 
Um, but I think, too, what really resided with me was, um, you know, going through the NCCP, it opened up so many doors and so many experiences for me. This was my opportunity. And I knew that not everyone's experience was the same. Like, I had an amazing experience, and I learned so much at the NCI under Ken. Uh, and continue to learn. Like he came to Regia College afterwards. He like came into my practices. Someone was always crying by the end. And so, um, you know, he continued to to be a mentor to me afterwards. And I know not everyone got that experience at the NCIs. And so, this was my opportunity to go back and um, take a look at the program and and see could I make some changes. A, to, you know, get things accessible. That was the other thing, too. Being in Alberta from Ontario, I realized how it was really hard to, um, you know, get to some of the items that Canada Basketball was offering. And so is there a way to start circulating that around the country? And so I really took that on, came to Canada Basketball, had to fill Mike McKay's shoes, which were like the biggest pair of shoes you could ever find in basketball in Canada. Um, but, you know, was really lucky. He was open to it. He mentored me. He uh, guided me and gave me some space to um, you know, do some changes and designs, and he was always there to lean on and be a resource and a continuous learning facilitator and evaluator. Thanks, Mike. Um, and so, uh, you know, got these opportunities. So started a uh, game plan and super clinic, you know, trying to find a way um, to showcase some of the things that Canada Basketball had to offer to more coaches. Um, and the things that, you know, basically I walked in and there, I remember there was like a um, a bookcase of like videos and clinics of like Elsa McNeil and and Lisa, who I'm sure a lot of you guys saw last month. And I'm um, thinking how I would have killed to get my hands on some of this stuff when I was at Red Deer College. And so really challenged myself to say like, how can I get this out for all the other coaches? Um, you know, and really took my mentality. Like what are the, what are the events that I would like to be a fly on the wall and how can I open those up to other coaches across the country? So, you know, we started to do Raptors training camps. We tried to open those up. Um, and so we did some of those in Vancouver. I mean, the women have been unbelievable champions, taking as much as they can out to Edmonton and opening those up and trying to have some of those, um, you know, uh, coach schools and, and so forth and, you know, bringing people in. Uh, we were lucky enough to have um, Basketball Without Borders when... Um, what was it? It was uh, All Star, I guess that was 2015, come to Toronto, and we opened that up to coaches um, to have them come in. And so that's, I think, at the lower right hand corner and start to work with some of those programs. And then got to work with a lot of the executive directors in, in the lower left hand corner. You can see a lot of them there all um, looking pretty bright and shiny in red. And so really got to work with the provinces to see. Um, and that was the other thing when I, when I left um, Ontario and then. Um, you know, refereed and coached in BC and then, you know, in, on, in Alberta, really saw how the, there was such a difference between all of them. And everyone in their own province thought what was happening with the provincial organization wasn't enough. Um, but they have no idea how much they're actually getting compared to some of the other provinces. And so when I was in like three of the largest and uh, how much there was there to offer compared to even some of the small provinces. So again, got the opportunity to um, support and share the different PTSOs in the administration to see if, um, you know, they could lend, borrow, um, you know, some of the activities that were going on and, and um, you know, really get involved in some of it. So really great experience. I met a lot of you while being there. I know Tom, you know, we were in training sessions together. I mean, a ton of you, uh, we ended up meeting through this space. So, um, Two sort of like proud moments, or I guess maybe the one on the left is the most proud. Um, Canada Basketball's Education Department was recognized for um, the Sheila Robinson Award. And so uh, it's a national award recognizing the sport that has made um, the biggest sort of impact around coaches and coaches' education. So um, really happy to accept that on behalf of Canada Basketball and just know that how many coaches... Uh, you know, coming from Red Deer College and not having this like huge background, how open coaches were across the country. I mean, I was so nervous. I remember my very first clinic in my role at Canada Basketball was with um, Eli Pasquale, not Eli Pasquale, with, um, oh my goodness. Oh, I forget his first name, but Coach Pasquale and, um, from Italy. And it was there in front of all of the, the CIS coaches. And so it was at national championships, um, when any time our team got knocked out in playoffs on at Red Deer College, I'd always like jump on the coaching staff of the men's team because uh, I just like wasn't done coaching for the year. And so we had actually gone out to um, 
Nova Scotia for national championships, took like a red eye back to get back for this. Uh, and I remember standing in front of all of the youth sport coaches and just being so, or say yes, I guess at the time, but being so nervous in this role um, and now being in some sort of situation that I was supposed to guide and lead. And, um, you know, everyone was so great, like literally so great. And so um, it was really awesome to have coaches across the country um, get involved and be presenters and, um, you know, get into giving back uh, into the communities, which they're already doing, but in a, in a formalized uh, way. So that was pretty cool. And then I can't, uh, you know, go on without talking about our national teams. Like they're just, those athletes are some, I can never get through this without crying, but um, these athletes are some of like the best the best athletes ever. And um, if you haven't had a chance to go in and observe the practice or see what the, the sacrifices that they make to represent our country, like it's not even portrayed properly in the media, but seeing it year after year and uh, the women and the men that do that, it's, it, it is honestly one of the coolest experiences um, to be a part of. And so I think, um, yeah, definitely kudos to, to the women there who, uh, on the team who I still continue to, to talk with and now get to see them uh, in the WNBA and, and playing, which is so cool. Uh, and again, a lot of the men who, who are playing in the league um, and all the development that Canada basketball and the pathway in the hand that they have and all of it, like it just, it does not get recognized um, the way it should. So if you haven't had a chance, get out to one of their training camps, get out to our practice, because it is it is really, really a really cool situation. And so there was a highlight moment in Newfoundland uh, where we got to meet President, uh, our President, my goodness, in the U.S. too long, Prime Minister um, uh, Trudeau. And so some really cool experiences there. And um, this is where uh, actually my very first really uncomfortable situation occurred uh, was when Mike McKay walked into my office and said, hey, Ireland, uh, we'd love uh, someone to come over and um, do some presentations. And uh, I gave them your name. Would that be something you're interested in too? And I was like, I don't know if I can do that. Like in my mind, I thought I was going to get off the plane. They're going to meet me and they're going to say, you should really get back on that plane. And, and thanks for, for making the trip. And so, um, you know, Mike was a huge cheerleader and supporter and walked me through my presentation. And that was sort of my first international um, presentation. So that's the, the photo in the middle. And then I went into a university there in the left. And um, it, it was such a game changer in my pathway um, in a confidence builder, even though it was like the most uncomfortable uh, scenario ever. <laughs> uh, and, you know, a lot of those colleagues, uh, are people that were there, I still communicate with them. That was probably like six years ago. Um, and they've come to some of my other presentations in other countries uh, in Europe, which has been really cool. So, um, and the last thing too, is I sat down and consulted with some of their ideas around um, coaching education and they just put out their new, new coaching education platform um, and, uh, you know, ended up saying that, you know, I had a big influence on them. So I um, started to get a taste of that, presented at the Olympic Symposium, which was really great. Uh, on the right, got a chance to represent um, the F in FIBA Americas committee. So started with them um, maybe four or five years ago on the youth development and started to look into more of the Americas and what can we do and lend and share um, in those capacities. And you can see there's like a huge female diversity in that group there, like the only one um, in, in that group, but uh, we're working on it. Anyways, we're working on it. Um, but stay true to development and learning and just really knowing that I was so far from knowing it all. Um, and so wanted to continue to develop. So ended up uh, rolling in what they call the FECC. So uh, FIBA Europe Coaching Certification. So it's a three-year certification program um, through Europe. And uh, you end up with all these coaches from around the world um, and learn more about coaching. So it's like you had to do presentations, you had to do uh, different scouting reports, and it, it always went in conjunction with um, a European championship. And so you kind of followed the ages and athletes along and uh, ended up meeting, uh, you know, uh, Pablo Lasso, like some really great coaches that you had to present in front of. He was the head coach of uh, SC Barcelona, I think at the time. I don't think he's still there, but um, yeah, had to, I had to run a practice in front of him. And honestly, it was like in Italy in the summer, no air conditioning, it was like a cement floor. It was like 40 degrees. I've never sweat so much in my life. I had to be the player for the practices before and then be like sharp and ready to go to run my practice and then got a complete evaluation on it. So um, the top three coaches 
uh, sorry, top four coaches end up being the coaching staff for the European All-Star Game. Um, and it uh, turns out I came fifth in the class. So missed out on my All-Star. It's like the worst. I know. I swear if I'd went gone earlier in that day, I would have been more fresh. I don't know all the swats and everything that I had to do. But anyways, um, it was it was a really great experience there too. And a lot of those coaches, um, you know, work for national teams around the world. So as I traveled with Canada basketball, a lot of times they would be coaching um, when I was there with the Federation and, and so forth. So uh, again, continual uh, commitment to that and um, ended up o opening a consulting company uh, when I was at Canada basketball. So um, ended up uh, taking time off at Canada Basketball to consult different federations, non-competing federations. So Canada Basketball always approved the contract, um, but worked with different federations around uh, the world. And so um, this, was, this was really cool uh, to do. So this was in Sweden, uh, ended up presenting to their professional league and then working um, in several in their federation for a couple days and then um, kind of drove across Sweden or um, to work with a different uh, provincial, uh, I guess, they don't have provinces, but provincial organizations. And so I um, had a really great experience here on the left. Uh, it was with um, FIBA and uh, in Mexico, they did a mini basketball. And so I uh, presented there and, and worked with the rest of the Argentinian coaches. I was the only person that didn't speak English. So they thought it was hilarious every night at dinner. They tell the waitress that it was my birthday and I would end up with tequila shots and a sombrero on my head. But um, that was Mexico and uh, Uruguay and uh, Colombia and um, this is in Colombia and this was a really cool experience because I was the first female to ever present at their coaching clinic. Um, and so I took a photo there with all the females. It was the highest number of females that attended any of their coaching clinics. Um, so it was a really neat experience um, to get into some of these countries where you know, I knew playing basketball with a ponytail was a privilege in Canada that wasn't a privilege in, in Japan or, um, you know, walking into a coaching clinic and having, you know, some, you know, other female coaches there with me, whereas I go into another country and that's not normal. And so, you know, how could I impact, how can I be responsible in some of that change, knowing what that experience had been given to me? Um, and so, um then it uh, ended up with Mike McKay in London, and we ended up getting uh, doing a small contract with um, the NBA at their global games. So they started to do global games around um, the world, and Mike and I ended up doing sort of a five-day clinic um, with the, the English Basketball Federation there. Uh, and then actually the Swedish Basketball Federation came over afterwards, and we, we worked with them for a few days um, you know, after the game. So uh, really great experiences uh, internationally. Um, and then ended up doing a couple contracts. And I think this is where those new experiences come in. When Basketball Without Borders came to Toronto for All-Star, I remember, I don't, Michelle must have walked in my office, like most, most days, like, Dawn, something needs to be done. And so, um, you know, they wanted to come in and run this tournament. They'd, they'd always won, ran the Basketball Without Borders Global with the men, but they'd never run it with the women. And they needed someone to help do that. And so I said, yeah, of course, like, let's figure it out. And so we brought 12 women in from Africa, we brought some women in from across Canada and had our sort of first Basketball Without Borders women's camp um, at an all-star. And so after that, um, they ended up bringing me in as a guest coach and, and got some really cool experiences at all-star games. Um, they have sort of this new generation camp where we bring in the top women outside of top like scouted women or, or notable women outside of um, the U.S. and bring them in and you know like that was an amazing experience I would give um, on my bench I would give instructions in English and French my like butchered Spanish and then I have a translator putting it into Turkish into Chinese and into Portuguese and so of the eight players uh, only two would speak English and the rest did not speak English at all, just spoke other languages. And so you think about the importance of um, A, demoing and drawing um, and being very clear in your communication, like that got fully tested in that. Um, Could you just think about how things get messed up in, in uh, from that timeout to the court, but then like having to be translated in four other languages. So um, some really cool uh, experiences there. Ended up contracting them to do, uh, write their curriculum for their basketball without borders, or sorry, their coaches academies. Um, and so they ended up opening up NBA academies in, uh, you know, seven of them around the world. And so worked with Brett Gunning from um, the Houston Rockets. He was assistant coach there and we wrote the curriculum 
um, for the athletes there. And so started to do some of this contract work. Um, this is in Columbia, back in Columbia again. It was, uh, you know, this is a, another experience. Like we think of, you know, presenting in Canada, like, thank goodness I'd done all those um, sort of clinics. Like even too, I remember in Victoria at Camosun College, we would do sort of like a, um, a day where the physical education teachers come out and, uh, you know, you do it in English. Well, here, like you have a translator, um, you know, the athletes don't speak English and, uh, you know, really trying to figure out how to do that. And, you know, Mike is like the master of that. Uh, and so, you know, working alongside, you know, some people that really impacted you and, and showed you what this looked like, uh, made it a lot easier to, to try yourself. So I think that's where, again, like get out in those comfort zones, volunteer, come into those situations, because I can't believe how many of those showed up um, later on. Uh, and then, of course, working with the Canadian athletes that were coming through. And so these are some of the athletes that are you know, in the NCAA that are moving on to their pro careers. Um, and, you know, it's just really great to, to see them in those environments and, and work with them. Um, and part of our national teams, again, uh, pride and national team in, in representing Canada. But it's really cool to see them in these environments. Um, and so then actually ended up um, talking about new experience and uncomfortable. I was like the person that I would rather do an exam than write an essay. So um, when the chance to write a book came up, I said yes, because that makes sense. Um, and so decided to take that on. So with Kathy Brook uh, and myself, you know, in my mind, I thought if I'm going to do a project, it's a bit of a passion project. I want to do it with someone I really love working with. And so Kathy, for me, uh, is great. Uh, and if anyone had met her, she... She's now an executive director um, at one of the sports. I want to say racquetball. I don't even know if that's right, but it used to be our government um, liaison to the Coaching Association of Canada. And so I had worked with her on several projects and thought, you know what, let's do this. So this is us shooting the photos of the book. Uh, and we really had to design what photos were important in order in this on the right in, in a basic layup. And, and of course, the kids chin the ball the whole way and show the ball to the inside of the defense. And so, um, you know, trying to get the athletes uh, to do that and, and go through that and then write the book alongside these photos. So another really cool experience. Um, and so still while at Canada Basketball, uh, continuously looking for ways to develop. There's a program at the University of Delaware that's called the International um, coaches apprenticeship program and so it's like a four-month graduate uh, program and so went there and ironically one of um, the guys in the upper left hand corner this is in my graduating class uh, actually did the master's with me in um, Italy so showed up and he was there again and then um, the guy on the far I think it's far left he's actually going to be in um, Rwanda with me next month so I'll be able to see him there he's working with um, the team from Angola, I believe, uh, as a coach. So uh, it's like neat, again, how the paths cross uh, in these sort of circumstances. But uh, Jay Trano was really great. We bumped into him. So he came over and said hi to the whole class. And as part of this, you get placed with an NCAA school. So the whole reason why I did this program is I didn't play in the NCAA. I didn't coach in the NCAA. And I felt like it was a system that I didn't really understand and I wanted to learn more about. Um, so really identified it as a gap. So I ended up getting placed at um, University of North Carolina. So was there for about three, two and a half months, I guess it was, traveled with the women's team, ran over and watched the practices with the men's team, uh, was part of their fundraiser. So um, this is Sylvia Crawley. She's like the first woman to dunk in the WNBA, but she's one of their assistant coaches. Um, and then uh, um, RJ was up at Duke. So then I was able to run over sometimes to Duke's practices because it was pretty close. Um, so yeah, it was a really great experience to learn, um, that Canada basketball was gracious enough to give me a bit of a leave of absence to be able to continue to learn, um, and, and was able to, to get some of these additional experiences. And so I think, um, that brings me to sort of my fourth thing was that when I really started, I think it's easy as a coach to get competitive. Um, and sort of look like what's the next job that's open and, um, you know, what school can I move to? What recruit can I need to get? And there's like, there could be a lot of negative energy going along. But I think once I started really focusing on myself and my own pathway um, and removed myself from a lot of those conversations that I think happen over beers and after games or at tournaments, uh, I think a lot of these really cool opportunities opened up. Um, and I don't think at the beginning when I thought about coaching, 
I thought about how rewarding um, coaching education was or being a part of that system was. And, you know, when I was a coach, I was coaching 12 athletes and I was able to impact them. Sometimes I had a couple teams a year, so it might be 24 athletes, or you might work at a center of performance and you might have a couple more athletes. But when we got into uh, Canada basketball and worked with the learning facilitators, you, like, you really started to realize that, you know, there you had about 15 to 20 coaches or 18, let's keep it to the limits here, uh, 18 coaches per class. And each one of those had 12 athletes. And so now you really got the opportunity to influence on a wider scale um, and, you know, really rewarding. So um, that's, I'm there with Ruth Riley uh, in Columbia. So she was my assistant coach, actually, Ruth Riley. Um, is actually an analyst for um, Miami, but played in the WNBA. It was like an all-star. She's like incredible. Uh, Jamal Murray, uh, got to, he came with us to Columbia, so got to work with him. He was on um, my squad as well. And you can see there's a photo with uh, a lot of the, the staff from Canada basketball with Rike and, and uh, Danielle and, and the impact that they had there. And then, you know, at the bottom, you know, meeting really cool people like, um, you know, the only female to coach uh, on the men's side or had coached on the men's side of, of youth sport and, um, you know, coaches that we got to bring in into the super clinic, which um, gave me my development side as well, but hopefully got to share it with the rest of coaches uh, around the world. And so I wanted to circle back um, to that, like, second slide where I said, um, you know, how important volunteering and, you know, trying new things were. And for me, um, scorekeeping, like, you know, I just went in, I got a couple bucks, I got to see more basketball, but I would have never anticipated that when I moved to Toronto that they were just looking for another scorekeeper with the Raptors. And so I um, ended up scorekeeping with the Raptors. And because I had volunteered and done that when I was like 17, um, you know, my resume was up to par and I could uh, come in and um, scorekeep. And of course, because I'd been an official, um, you know, that really helped as well. And so with that, uh, got an opportunity to, to score for Eat with the Raptors. And no one could have told me at 17 that volunteering um, to do those tournaments or like staying after I refereed a game to score, keep a game, that it would get me um, an NBA championship ring. So um, being with the team, technically I was on staff. And so um, I, am, I was issued a, a championship ring with my name on it and, um, you know, now I can walk around the NBA office with like one of the only people other than a, a couple of um, the uh, alumnus that played in the NBA that might have a championship ring, but I can say, well, I do too, actually. So, um, you know, it makes it a pretty cool item to be able to walk around uh, the New York office with, with. But I think, you know, it shocks me still to this day how some of those volunteer and random things, um, how much that's really impacted and allowed for experiences uh, to either present themselves or for me to be ready for them. Um, and so I keep that very close to me. Like I know volunteering for things now is gonna prep me forever. I might end up in five years or 10 years and I have no idea what it's gonna be. Um, officiating was another really big one. I ended up, uh, when I was coaching men's college, I was on the Canada West officials um, panel. And so I'd, I'd officiate uh, sometimes the women's commotion team, which is a whole other story, but um, or at UVic and, and do some of those games. But then I would coach the the men's college team. And so, um, you know, when I was in Alberta, I tried to stay involved. It was pretty tough in central Alberta, but tried to do some games and did some like, um, again, maybe controversial, but would uh, referee, you know, the high school finals or or so forth um, while I was coaching at, at Regia College. So really tried, it first grounded me and remembered, reminded me how hard it was. Um, but two, you know, when I ended up at Canada Basketball and Portfolio Grow and got into domestic development, gave me the platform to be able to speak to the officials and, and help pull the officials into Canada Basketball, where I truly believed it should be. Um, and, you know, again, I got referee education in Ontario, in Alberta, and in BC, and I saw the difference um, and really thought, you know what, I think we can provide more to the officials the way we do for coaches, and I think there's an opportunity here. Um, and was really able to enroll people in this vision, and then, you know, they've just taken it and ran, and now they're in such a wonderful position, and I still meet every uh, few, few, few Monday nights with, with the squad to see what I can continue to contribute and, and help with to, to have that development. So I also highly re recommend officiating and getting involved with that. It, it was really good. And I think my last one is, um, 
developing a support network, I don't think I could get through it uh, without, I, I know, I could not have got through it. Like the calls from the airport where I'm like, they're going to send me home. I, I feel like a fraud. I don't even know why I'm here. Um, you know, to tough games or tough travel schedules or, um, you know, so forth. But uh, really lucky to have that. And I think to any of the women on the call, having a female network is is night and day changing. Like, uh, get one right away. <laughs> Just do it. I, I think, um, you know, some of these women, you know, now that, you know, VP at the Raptors or, um, you know, head of basketball operations with Orlando, you know, heads, she's a, Vanya's like a scout with the Chicago Bulls. And, um, you know, some of the, the alumnus down there, um, they work with Boston. Uh, but now uh, you can know, call them and, and they understand and you have this conversation and you run into them. And Bailey, of course, and, and all my colleagues from Canada Basketball, um, they, they've been complete rocks in some of these odd situations that come up for females. And I think um, I say that not because not for someone to feel bad, but just to know that they exist and to help prevent them for other females coming forward. But there's definitely awkward ones up there. And I think, um, you know, having that network is really, really, really important. So um, that's sort of my, my fifth, uh, you know, hindsight piece of, uh, or, or nugget, golden nugget, uh, as we like to call. Um, so now uh, I work at, in New York, ended up, um, you know, it, it was a real coincidence uh, person that ended up bringing that Basketball Without Borders in 2015 to Toronto, um, got promoted and had to backfill. And so they ended up calling me and asking if I would be interested to backfill their position. And that's really how that happened. And um, so yeah, now work in the New York office. It's a really cool office. Um, it's just up the street. I, I did a really smart move, moved five blocks from the office to make sure I was really close. And now we never go in. So um, that worked out really well for me. But uh, role now is, is working. Um, I work in international basketball operations and um, work on the strategy of delivery of grassroots basketball in 118 countries outside the US. And so we've got seven uh, global offices um, international offices, and we've got basketball operations in most of them. Um, looking to fill a couple right now, but uh, in most of those, and um, you know, get the opportunity to um, you know display basketball to kids and coaches and, and referees in a grassroots manner that hopefully they'll fall in love with it the way I did, and it can provide them some opportunities um, in a different manner. And so that's really, um, you know, what, what I do now. Um, this year's obviously been crazy, just like everybody else, um, but that's kind of what, what I've been up to. And so got some really cool experiences before the pandemic, um, got to Mexico City um, for the global game uh, and worked with some of the athletes there. And uh, of course, um, DeAndre Aiden, who came in, and some of the athletes that come through to help us. Uh, here's in Puerto Rico, we launched a junior NBA league for underprivileged um, uh, regions. So we had 720 kids playing in this league from underprivileged uh, regions. So launched that with the ministry uh, there. Uh, so had a little draft party with a full-out Puerto Rican DJ going on. It was pretty wild. So wouldn't see that these days. Uh, and then, you know, this is a trip to Mumbai, Um and uh, got to work with uh, the coaches there that came in from like Sweden and uh, Norway uh, that were part of our international staff. That's the group of athletes that I mentioned that they're like, hey, can you run a practice tonight? So um, the top left, that was, well, that was us uh, running practice out at night outside with like random few lights that popped up. And on the right, this is um, what we call a Junior NBA Coaches Academy, which is really like a one day course for teachers. Um, and so we actually had like 2,000 uh, teachers in this course, and these were like the nine females um, that were there. So pulled them out and again, really acknowledging um, the privileges that, that we have um, living in Canada as females and, and what we can and what we have access to and that is very different for female coaches in other areas. So um, I wanted to make sure that they felt acknowledged and that they continue their path and um, you know, really working to set up with FIBA now, some of the pathways, like they have their FIBA level one. So just rewrote an MOU with them so that um, in some of these target regions, we can run a clinic like this and provide a pathway um, into FIBA's uh, coaching certification and so forth. So um, I had to pivot a lot this year, uh, moving to some online. We created this like online uh, virtual world um, and brought uh, kids in from... 
I think it was 62 countries into this platform. So there's a uh, by who played at Syracuse, who works on my team, myself, and we were presenting and we brought some talent in. Um, and there's like, uh, we brought a DJ in and there was like a beach party. It was like the weirdest thing ever. Um, but then, you know, had some online coaching seminars, just like everyone else and every other federation um, and started to provide that uh, globally for, for coaches and referees and, and so forth. You can see our little avatars on the upper right. So uh, Coach Brian Gates uh, came in and, and did a really cool decision-making session. And then um, on the lower right, that's by and I uh, back in the office we did. I thought this was really cool. So in Indonesia, we are doing a live broadcast to athletes there. So we did a clinic, but we did it in the boardroom. We like cleared everything out. Um, and then we had a translator in Indonesia translating our instructions and our content team in Hong Kong capturing it. And then it was displayed in Indonesia in language. So um, unbelievable technology and, and so forth. So that was our attempt to get kids active in their homes. Um, and I think those just last, very, very last piece is um, the importance to look for mentors and sponsors. And, um, you know, I, I don't think I went out searching for them but those that ended up being those people for me really, really impacted, um, you know, my life, really my life, where I am, what I'm doing. And so, you know, I try to be that for others, but, um, you know, so grateful and so thankful for those that opened doorways uh, for me as well. So that's, uh, that's kind of where, where we are today um, and what's going on. So I don't know, I think we got some time left if anyone's got any questions or uh, anything else I can can circle on. Okay. Oh, sounds like Reagan. Reagan, that's your question. But balls bouncing in the background. Balls bouncing. <laughs> yes, I have, to, I have to run the. I have to run this session from the gym tonight. Actually, so we're actually uh, actually on here. I know I'm, I'm seeing Mike on here. I'll be happy. We're talking about hip hinges and getting the getting body movement right. So, um, so we don't don't ever want to uh, ever want to make sure we're teaching anything wrong. But uh, I was able to listen. I wasn't able to see all the slides as we were coaching while uh, coaching while having a coaching clinic. So. <laughs> um, so it was, uh, the, the, it was awesome. It up with, it, it's how it always should be, right? So, uh, it's uh, fantastic. Happens, I, think. <laughs> yeah. I think that was fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for getting outside of your comfort zone and telling your story. I think it's very inspiring. You've done way more uh, professional things than I ever thought you did. I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Yeah, thanks for everyone staying on and coming on. And it's like actually really great. I have not been able to get back to Canada. So that was one of the cool things about being a can of basketball is that I got to see my friends and colleagues from across the country on a regular basis. And so uh, miss, miss crossing paths with all of you. Does Hopefully anyone have any questions for Don? Yeah, please feel free to just raise a hand, blurt them out or type them in the chat. You've obviously spent a lot of time on coach education um, with game plan and everything else you've done with Canada basketball. Um, how, wh where would you place that coach education and coach development for all of us coaches out here yeah, that are continuing to learn, even us old people? Well, I, I think, uh, well, for me, I, not, none of this would happen if I didn't do NCCP. So, um, like, to me, it was the actual foundation. Uh, and, you know, now that I see what's going on in the rest of the world, like, there's some federations that have uh, coaching education. Like, we have no idea how lucky we are that it's in place, is accessible. Um, like, some countries, they have to wait, like, years just to get into a level one situation. They can only, like, have 18 people. Um, they, they just don't have access to, you know someone coming in and spending three days with you to talk about what do you do, how, why do you do it? Um, you know, and even too, like I know sometimes the evaluation is, is a barrier, but you know, you have someone dedicated to you, to your practice to come in and watch and say, have you thought about this? Have you looked at this? Um, and you don't find that else in the world, like Spain a little bit, Australia kind of, 
Um, but I'm talking like on the palm of my hand, I can count the countries that have this sort of experience. And so I think sometimes because it's like a sec accessible to us, we don't realize what we have. Um, and, you know, not not every situation is perfect, but um, there's always something that comes out of it. And so, I don't know, for me, coaching the coaching education, which is really why I was so passionate at Canada Basketball to be involved in it and to, you know, continue to find ways to improve it. And how could we distribute it? Like, how do we get into the smaller countries? How can we um, get it easier for people to register? How can we get more learning facilitators trained? How we stay trained and stay current? Um, you know, have an evaluation feedback system, all these sort of components to allow for the coach experience to be like better and better. And so for those of you that haven't taken NCCP, I highly recommend it. Um, like for me, I took it all the way through and uh, as far as I could go in Canada and then tried to search out programs internationally, like where else can I find more coaching education? There's not a ton, there really isn't. Um, and you do have to go search and look for it. And although it was like, sometimes people cringe at their price, it's like the price is way higher elsewhere, I'll tell you that. So um, I, I highly recommend it. And those of you that are into coaching and into teaching, I think one of the best ways to give back, I know there's so much reward in your athlete relationships, but the, I'll tell you right now, the reward in working with other coaches uh, is, is equally, if not greater, because you see all the athletes that get impacted by that. So like, I know a bunch of you on here already do that, like Mike and Mike and Mike and, uh, you know, Reagan and Mark and Tom, and, and a lot of you guys are already doing this. Um, but if, if you haven't thought about it yet, I think it is, um, you know, something to consider to get involved with and, and get trained. It, it's a really cool experience and we need more people out there. Um, that are that are passionate and and committed to to this sort of thing, so that the kids are having the best experience and I'm falling in love with this game. Yeah, there's there's a question there for you, Don from Nell. Um, and just before you answer that one, uh, I think there's a lot of great minds out there, a lot of great basketball coaches, and and Mike McKay is certainly one of them. And Mike, I know you're on this call, that are very accessible. They're busy, but they're very accessible. They want to talk basketball with you, and for whatever reason, there's a lot of young coaches that won't approach these people and and i i think if you get an opportunity to contact mike mckay when he's got the time he'll get back to you and you learn so much so much i value but even that like honestly you and reagan are great resources like there's resources in your backyard i can remember um at in ottawa uh, when i was young i would go and watch um practices at uh, Ashbury College, which is actually a high school, but Andy Sparks was actually the coach at the time um, who ended up, who's now the coach at Ottawa U. I think he's still there, but, um, and I would just come and sit and watch those practices. And so I was coaching the zone teams and he was one of the better coaches in the city. And so I would just come and watch like Dave Smart's, um, well, basketball camps, I would work, but um, I would come and sit in the practice and ask questions and uh, he would play mind games with me and then, you know, I would leave and try and figure it out. And so, um, but, I, you know, those are really, really valuable experiences. And you'd be surprised how open people are um, to going in and learning. And then I think as a coach, challenging yourself to um, take like one thing and put it into your practice. And so I used to go to these um, three of a kind clinics in Spain. Uh, and so they take like three of the Euroleague coaches and they present in Barcelona. And so I would always come back and I know there's a bunch of provincial team athletes on here, but, and coaches, Doug's on here too. So poor Doug had to love this, Leon. Um, I'd come back and be like, hey, I just learned this. Like, or I just learned this out of bounds play, or I just learned this like, you know, new transition drill, I want to try it. And, um, you know, finding those, those spaces, that was like one of the cool things about Red Deer is I was like, I knew I was a young coach and so, in my mind, I'm like, I had to coach as many teams as possible because the one thing that I, I, first of all, I knew I had to be more educated than um, a man applying for a job. It was just kind of the world of basketball where, where it was at the time. And so, um, but the thing that I couldn't do is, you know, get more experience because I was only alive so many years. So a lot of coaches had been coaching longer than I'd been alive. And so um, what I tried to do is coach as many teams as I could in one year. And so I would try to do provincial team. I would try and help with a club team in town. I would do the college team. I would do center of performance. And then I would try to go in as observer to Canada basketball and, and sit in on those or try and do an overseas experience. So like um, with the Bermudian national team or, or whatever other um, situation I could get into. And so um, I, 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 in my mind, I thought, well, I could do like four 
four seasons in one year. Um, but, you know, really what was cool about that is that the seasons, some of them were short. And so you could try it. And if it completely was a terrible out of bounds play, um, then you could scrap it and, and just never use again. <laughs> So thanks to the players that were, were open to that. Uh, I think Caitlin's on here too. So she was probably the, the biggest, as a captain at Red Deer College for a long time, had to endure that as well. Also, I think got pulled out. And, you know, that's the other thing too, um, as, as coaches. So I saw a stat when I was working at Canada Basketball that there's a 60% higher percentage of girls being coaches, like long-term coaches, if you introduce them to coaching before the age of 15, 15, 16, 17. But if you recruit them the way we recruit men into coaching, so men, it's like they get injured and you're like, hey, do you want to sit on the bench? Do you want to be a coach? Or they finish and you're like, hey, what do you want to do next year? Do you want to be my assistant coach? Women tend to plan four to five years in advance. And so if you wait until that point, they've already planned the next five years and it's not in coaching if they haven't been introduced to it. And so you can see actually Hockey Canada has done an amazing job um, in their national team programs where they introduce their national team athletes at, at their like under 15, under 16, under 17 teams to coaching. And you can see massive pathways um, and a lot of their, their Olympic athletes coming into coaching now. But I think where that's cool um, is I got introduced, like my dad introduced me to coaching um, when I was still in high school. And so if you talk to a lot of female coaches, a lot of them were introduced at a young age. Either their parents were involved in coaching uh, and ended up at the sideline or someone impacted them or influenced them uh, into coaching. And so I say that, long story short, that Caitlin used to come to a lot of provincial team practices and was a coach on the side. So um, thanks, Caitlin, for, for being a trooper on that too. So I'll just circle back. Randy, it's really wonderful to see you uh, as well. Also um, great to have so many basketball people here, but um, now a great question. What would you give uh, advice to give a young coach looking to volunteer during COVID? Yeah, great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, what I do, I, I reserve an hour every last Thursday of the month uh, to connect with anyone that connects with me on LinkedIn. And so this is sort of you know, I choose to, like, how I want to be a stand in the in the world, in the world of basketball is one that's, like, motivating. And so um, in order to do that, inspiring and be motivating, I need to make time for that. And so that's the time that I make. And um, I think now that's where you can reach out to some people. Um, I'm not on the road as much. I say that as I'm about to leave for a month, but um, generally not on the road as much uh, and have been in one time zone for a long period of time, which is also really weird. And so uh, I think there's some opportunities around COVID to make some of these connections so that when things do open up and, you know, slowly and surely they will, um, you don't have to start from scratch. And, um, you know, some of these connections have already been made. And, you know, it's connections not necessarily asking for stuff, but it's like they are to learn, um, and, you know. And I think it's the other really great opportunity. Like this morning, I just started another course on project management. So now I feel like I have like 70 projects in, um, you know, all continents. And so, you know, I, I realized like I, no one's really trained me in project management. I've never really learned about that. And so um, one of the cool things about the MBA is they have NBA University where, and this is like one of the main reasons why, I know the MBA sounds cool, but I never actually dreamed to be part of the MBA. That wasn't really something um, that I imagined. It just kind of happened. And I think I was prepared uh, enough to be there. But um, when they told me about this MBA university, so during COVID, I've taken 28 courses. Um, and in my mind, I'm like, I'm prepping myself for whatever, wherever I'm going to be. Um, but I think COVID allows for the, a little bit more space for learning. Um, and so, yeah, I just started a seven week course this morning um, with one of the university's uh, accredited course on project management. And I think it's an opportunity for us to take a look at some of these gaps. Um, and get, you know, everything's pivoted online. So we have access to it right now. And you know what? A lot of us are in stuck in our homes or we've got limited access or we're not traveling and, um, you know, can maybe connect. And I, I do think some of these connections, there's another really cool, um, I found there's like a, on Fridays, there's a sort of international sports administration group that comes together on Friday afternoon. So it's like another good opportunity where you can just like connect with other people. And so sometimes I'll jump into that um, and just see what's going on in other sports and, you know, can you learn something there? So uh, now that's my best advice right now. I, I know it's really tough, um, but it's like, you know, what can you find where some of these gaps, like it's a really, Mike McKay is like the king of finding gaps. 
Um, and, you know, we do this with all our teams and we do this with our athletes, but it's a really good exercise. And he does this with our, our national team coaches. It's like, what are our personal gaps? And can we look at ourselves in a mirror to say, you know what, I don't know of enough about this. I, I could, you know, learn about it. Um, one of my colleagues who's also Canadian, Nico um, Loriero, who um, is from Sudbury, but uh, ended up moving to Quebec. He's now on my honor staff and, and helps me with Latin America. Uh, and so he started making like, it was like 6 a.m. before work, he would um, work with overseas coaches and just like have a, a two high level coaches himself and another buddy and would just like for half an hour ask questions to these high level coaches. And he just did that for like eight weeks running when COVID first hit. Um, so I think there's lots of really inventive opportunities there. Um, and uh, I, I would just encourage to, to take a look at some of those. Thanks again, Don. Anyone else? Sorry, Wayne. Yeah, no, it's fine. Thanks, Mark. Um, it, I feel a bit weird asking this question. I, I recognize a lot of the names that are in front of me. I'm a high school coach currently. I've been coaching high school for 20 years. I have a quote unquote real job and I feel funny asking Don, you're a fraction of my age. Um, I'm already thinking about, the reason I attended tonight is I'm thinking about the next step of my career. We live in a small center in Northern Alberta. And I'm thinking about the next step in my career. I'd like to up the ante, shall we say, in my basketball career. So I've got a five to 10 year plan in front of me and I would like to make basketball a full-time job in 10 years. So I'm now asking somebody that's a fraction of my age, what advice do you have uh, for me to, to do that? Uh, you know, I, you said, I don't know why people don't uh, reach out to other coaches and, you know, even at 40 plus years, I do find that intimidating. You know, I recognize a lot of big names here on the screen that I recognize, but you know, just reaching out saying, hey, what opportunities are there? You know, what what should I do? Uh, what should be, my next steps be? And you know, it is intimidating even. Yeah, so what I advice totally, do you have? Uh, I, I also get intimidated now too, having um, to ask some of the coaches that I work with or some of the athletes too. Um, it, it is a tough thing. And I, I think it's like, can you, um, can you be vulnerable enough to take no? <laughs> because that's the worst thing that will happen, right? It's like, no, sorry, I can't do that. And you know what? They're probably not the right person anyways, to be honest. They either don't have time at this moment, um, but I actually don't know a coach that would just go straight up no. Um, it would probably be some like next month's better or something like this. Like they might have to carve out time. So I think it's like that vulnerability um, being okay with no, uh, and like, no, doesn't mean anything. Um, I think that's a really big one. Like that's one I really had to learn, um, is like just asking that question, um, and what I made no mean. And I think I made that mean a lot when I lived in Alberta. Uh, I, I think I made my losses mean a lot. I think my standings meant a lot about who I was as a person. Um, and it took a lot of, I ended up taking these courses uh, at Landmark, Landmark Worldwide. They're some of the, like, in my mind, the best leadership courses you can take in communication. If I ever have a women's team again, I am absolutely taking that whole team um, to, to do that. And so um, I think, uh, know that coaches that are maybe in the positions that they are in now are there because someone else helped them. Um, and so I think most coaches would, would be open to helping others and, and opening that up. I do think, you know, Canada is a really tricky spot for full-time positions. So there's essentially a hundred full-time paid positions in Canada. There's 50 on the women's side and 50 on the men's. So there might be a couple more now because, um, some of the leagues have opened up a little bit, uh, and a couple of the schools now have some like full-time assistant positions. But I think it is unbelievably important to get in and start spending time in some of those university environments. And I know you're in Northern Alberta, so that's like not an easy task. Um, but like, you know, what are some ways, like if they come up on the, on the road, some of the college teams up north, or um, if you happen to be somewhere for work, can you pop in? And honestly, like, I bet you, like, listen, if Dave Smart doesn't say no, like none of these other coaches are going to say no. Um, and I think it's just getting over that, um, that hump. And, you know, even if a no comes up, then they probably weren't the best environment to get into um, to ask that question. And I would say for sure, go for it. Like, I think there's a, a lot of coaches uh, later in their career that have moved into the college system, into the university system. Um, and I don't think there is one pathway. I mean, for me, I always thought that I had to get as much education as I possibly could so that 
you know, if I was in the room with other people that had more education or more experience, which was often likely, that there was something I had that stood out. Um, and so I just tried to take that on. And it sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Like, I did not get the job at University of Western. Um, you know, that's like probably my, my, my one bane, the one job I really wanted after um, I coached the Ontario team. And I felt like half the girls were going to come there with me um, and uh, ended up giving it to Brian Chang. Uh, instead of myself. And so that was one that, that was like a gut wrencher for me. And I also interviewed for Ottawa U. Um, and uh, I, I didn't get that job. And Andy Sparks got it. Now I used to like sit in his practices and I kind of get it. And, you know, again, he had been coaching longer than I've been alive. Um, but like I've heard no so many times, so many times. And I think it's like, you know, it that one meant a lot to me, like going back to Ottawa. That one like, meant like so much to me. Uh, and, you know, start to question, like, could I even coach, like, in the university league? What doesn't really make a difference? And so, um, you know, but I was, I was saying those things. No one else was saying that to me. And so I was my worst enemy um, on that. And then to be honest, sometimes it's meant to be. Um, like, if I had taken some of the jobs, I would have never ended up in Canada basketball. And I love what I do now. Uh, and I loved coaching. And I always try and keep my hand in it. And actually, the staff here are really great. They'll let me come out and still be a guest coach in a lot of their 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 things. But um, I also like being an impact uh, in, a, in a large scale as well. And so, like, can you do both? And I think you really can create whatever you want. You know, like, can you do part of your current job and, and be in it? And so I think there's ways to figure it out. But sometimes I think we have to get out of our own way. Um, and I was just sharing this last thing. I actually applied for Carlton U at the same time I applied for this job. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back into coaching or not. Um, and again, I didn't get it, but if I had got it, I wouldn't have applied for this job. Uh, I would have been open for the job at the MBA. And so, you know, sometimes it's just like not meant to be, and that's okay. And there's no like real big reason behind it. Um, and it doesn't mean that maybe I can't go back to coaching, um, and, and do it at another period of time if, if, if that's what I, I want to do, or if it's a good fit. So, um, I think, you know, without being like sounding rude, I think get out of your own way. Like, just get out of your own way and, and start asking the question and, like, get comfortable with a few no's um, and know that it literally means zero about you. Um, and uh, I, I would bet the next time we talk, you're going to tell me how many practices you've, like, sat in and the connections that you started to make because it really is um, those connections that help out continuously. They're, they're, they're it. Those connections in, you know, a hundred job situation is is really impactful when the athletic director, and honestly, the system's not as like structured as you think it is. Um, it's not, you know, like you don't, you see people get, getting jobs all the time. Like you just, it's the right place. It's the right time. Um, and if the athletic director sees you around, like a lot of times that really helps out because a lot of the athletic directors aren't sports people anymore either. Um, and so it's a little bit of a comfort sort of situation. I think that that plays in, in in a lot of those scenarios too. Now that I've like watched it play out over, you know, a whole bunch of years, you know, it's not as sophisticated as it felt when I was looking at it, when I, you know, was at Victoria and trying to figure out how do I get one of those jobs. And I really like I spent a, I, I can remember sitting on beers with other coaches thinking like, okay, so who didn't have a good season? Like, who's not going to be there next year? Like, who's talking about retiring? Like, which job's coming out? Could I see myself in Quebec? Like, I remember going through that. I spent so much energy on that and it's such a waste of time. It is a, you never know what's going to happen. You have zero control on it. All I can do is make sure that I'm like coaching enough teams. I'm learning, I'm figuring out my gaps and I'm ready for the chance that someone takes my CV and allows me to have an interview in front of the athletic director. And then I do the best I can. And then it's like, it's, sometimes people say no to jobs and you end up in the job. Sometimes you're not supposed to be there because you have a different pathway. I hope that helps a little bit. Sorry, now yet another question. I feel sometimes I don't want to bother coaches as they're busy, um, but I have to do a better job. Totally, just do it. Honestly, just do it. Like, I, I don't know, even know how else to, to frame it. Um, yeah. yeah, don't give them an excuse, honestly. Like, you're giving it to them. Let them give it to you. Um, but yeah, honestly, I, I talk to random people from around the world on Thursdays, every, every last Thursday, and it's like random people. I, I don't know if I really have answers to anything, but um, certainly I open the opportunity to do so. 
So I hope that helps a little. Any other questions or thoughts or? Once again, Don, I think that was great. Yeah, no, find your gaps, fill your gaps and get connected. That's fantastic. Perfect, perfect story. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, of course, reach out. I hope our paths will cross in person. See you and I hope to see you at one of the national team practices where I can like stop in or hopefully the men will play in Victoria and I can get there to watch them play or uh, the women. Um, you know, like so hope that our paths cross soon. And if there's anything I can do, feel free to reach out. The best way is on LinkedIn because um, my email account is pretty full. I can use Twitter to be really transparent. But um, yeah, hit me up. I, I'd love to connect. Uh, I love working with people and, and connecting with people. And it's really nice to see you. So thanks, Reagan and Mark, for opening up this opportunity. Uh, and really nice to see some colleagues, colleagues from Alberta, uh, Doug. And Mandy, and Tom, and so, many. so thanks so much for, for being here. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Don. Appreciate it. And Don no said, and Don said if anyone wants to carry bags for her when she travels, just email her. Yeah. I don't <laughs> recommend Rwanda right now, but yeah. <laughs> you know, another trip might be better. <laughs> yeah, good point. Thanks so much, Don. Okay. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. Hey, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.